The argument from precedent seeks to establish that a lot of the themes in Christianity were also found in earlier ancient religions and that Christianity was therefore developed from them. Both minimal historicists and mythicists use this argument against triumphal historicists or apologists in that they both hold that much of the mythology associated with Christianity was derived from other religions, but this is quite distinct from the specifically mythicist argument from precedent that holds that not only the mythology of Jesus was based on precedent, but the figure of Jesus was also. The mythicist argument has two prongs. One of these is to argue that the character of Jesus was copied from other gods of the ancient world, rather than being based on a historical figure. And the other is that the whole idea of dying and rising saviour gods was very much in vogue with lots of examples, of which Jesus was simply the Jewish one. Superficially, it is a powerful argument, and consequently, it is the leading argument used in many mythicist presentations. Perhaps most notable is the film Zeitgeist. The idea is to present a number of ancient mythical figures and maintain that they had similar characteristics to Jesus, such as being born on December 25th, born of a virgin, crucified and resurrected after three days, etc. Then point out that all of these mythical figures were just that, mythical, and then ask, so why would Jesus not be mythical also? It's a beguiling argument, and its counter is unfortunately tedious, complex and rather esoteric. To counter it, therefore, you have to put yourself in the unenviable position of arguing a complex truth against a simple half-truth. But that won't stop us here. Note, however, that countering the argument from precedent is not easy to do from the pulpit or dispatch box. It is a job best suited to writing or the classroom. The flaw in the argument turns on data selection. Let's suppose that you want to make an argument that state-funded education improves literacy rates. You justify the claim with studies where you compare literacy rates between communities with and without state education, or before, during and after state education was provided. You select examples that illustrate the case best. There are, of course, thousands of potential cases to study. There are numerous countries and numerous educational authorities within countries. Furthermore, there are numerous time frames during which state education was and was not available. You're obviously going to pick the case studies that illustrate your point. Do a good job of this and you'll make a convincing argument, but there's a problem. Take the opposite hypothesis that state education reduces literacy. Now do the same process on the same overall educational data and you'll come up with just as convincing an argument. Why? In both cases, you have selected what data to present. Let's suppose that there is in fact no relationship between state education and literacy. The total amount of data available on education is vast. There are thousands of possible case studies. Random variation means that of these thousands of case studies, many will show little or no correlation between state education and literacy. Some will show a negative correlation and some will show a positive one. If you're putting one or other case in a debate, it's obvious what you're going to do. You're going to select the cases that justify your position. If, on the other hand, you are making an unbiased assessment of the situation, you'll have to be particularly careful to avoid such selection, either by taking in as broad an overall view as possible, or by choosing case studies by some means that avoid such selection effects, for example by random sampling. In general, when we hear somebody justifying a position by citing a few examples out of many possible cases, then they are making an argument from association. That is, an argument based on similar characteristics to their hypothesis. And the immediate suspicion is that their position is invalid, and they have selected their examples because they fit their hypothesis. So, in the present debate, we know about hundreds of gods from the ancient world. When we hear an argument that half a dozen of these gods look similar to Jesus, the immediate suspicion is that there is no association between other gods and Jesus, but there is significant random variation in the characteristics of gods. Given a large enough number of gods to choose from, we will inevitably find some that look similar to Jesus. But this is by random chance, rather than by any connection between them. 
these gods have been chosen because they look similar to Jesus. And while they do make a convincing sounding argument, the apparent convincing argument is an artefact of the presenter's data selection rather than being true. So in the case of Jesus, when looking at the argument from precedent, we need to be able to decide whether the arguments put to us are wholly or partly down to selection. There are two key things which determine how likely this is. One of these is the number of gods we have to choose from, and the other is the degree of similarity between our chosen God and Jesus. An artefact of selection is likely when the number of gods is large and the degree of similarity is small. A true relationship is likely when the number of gods is small and the degree of similarity is large. So, if we find a god who was born on December 25th, travelled around with 12 companions during his ministry, performed miracles, was put to death to save us from sin, was raised back to life on the third day and ascended into the afterlife, and we find that this god is one of a total of six possible candidates, then we can be pretty sure that the association of Jesus is real, rather than an artefact of selection. If, on the other hand, we find a god who died for no particular reason, then came back to life three years later, and then ended up in charge of the afterlife, and we find that this god is one of several hundred possible candidates, then we're going to be pretty sure that this association is an artefact of selection, rather than being real. And if you've read ahead, you will know that I'm referring to Zelmoxis. There are two other things we need to consider, and these are direct and circumstantial evidence. For example, we know that Sherlock Holmes was based on Dr. Joseph Bell, and we know this because we have direct evidence of it, in that Arthur Conan Doyle told us so. Had he not told us, we would still have circumstantial evidence, because we know that Joseph Bell was practising medicine at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary while Arthur Conan Doyle was a student there. We also know that Joseph Bell had a particular approach to diagnosis, of proposing several diagnoses and then making specific observations to discriminate between competing possibilities. Now, thousands of other doctors around the world and down the ages have used this approach. And without this circumstantial evidence, we wouldn't have much idea who Sherlock Holmes was based on. But with the circumstantial evidence, we can narrow it down to those doctors practising at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary during Conan Doyle's training, making Joseph Bell the leading candidate. So there are things that Sherlock Holmes has in common with Joseph Bell, but they are rather general and Joseph Bell is one of a large group of candidates for Holmes's prototype. Then we have circumstantial evidence. This radically narrows the group of doctors we have to choose from because we are now speaking about the group that shares that circumstantial evidence. With this in hand, we can be confident that Joseph Bell is the man. In the case of Jesus and the argument from precedent, we have no direct evidence linking any of the gods to Jesus in that we have no record of anybody saying that Jesus was based on any of them. And actually, that's not quite true. There is abundant direct evidence for one god, and that is Yahweh, but he is not one of those put forward by mythicists in this argument. Interestingly, Robert Price does make a case for a mythical Jesus based on Yahweh, but that's for another time. By circumstantial evidence, I mean evidence that suggests that a founder of Christianity knew of another god. Maybe a founder had previously worshipped the other god, had family who worshipped the other god, or the god was worshipped in the first half of the first century in Judea, or the first half of the first century anywhere in the Roman Empire. So, in the cases of both Sherlock Holmes and Jesus, we can see how circumstantial evidence fits into the assessment of evidence from association. Circumstantial evidence has the effect of restricting the number of gods from which we can select to those to whom the circumstantial evidence applies. And this in turn means that an argument for a particular god, for a given degree of similarity to Jesus, is stronger than it otherwise would be. It's worth noting that the historicist version of the argument, directed against apologists, uses circumstantial evidence. That is, evidence that the same populations progressed in their beliefs from other religions to Christianity, and we know this to be historically true. Aside from the obvious example of Judaism, the Roman populations first believed in Jupiter and his pantheon, and then solar invictus monotheism, then a mixture of the two, and then Christianity. 
and traces of all of these clearly appear in Christianity. Now, when looking at the question of similarity between gods, we need to be very careful about how specific characteristics are defined. Take, for example, born of a virgin. Do we mean born of an earthly woman who has never had sexual intercourse with a man or anything else? Or do we mean born of an earthly woman who has never had sexual intercourse with an earthly man, but may have had sexual intercourse with a god? Or perhaps we mean born of anything that has not had sexual intercourse, such as perhaps a rock? And those of you who have read ahead will know that I'm referring to Mithra. The point is that whatever definition we choose, we should apply it equally to all the gods under consideration. What we should not do is to apply one definition to gods in general, but another when applying it to a god that seems otherwise promising. I had intended to make a single video about the argument from precedent, starting with this introductory section, and then going on to look at some of the gods involved. You'll be relieved to hear that I changed my mind. It's been quite enough tedium for one video, so I'll leave it to the next video to start looking at the gods involved. But at least we have an idea of the method to apply. The essential facts we need to judge a potential precedent are firstly the similarity between that God and Jesus, and secondly the number of gods who share the same circumstantial evidence.